There are physical types in the espionage game that we call the little gray man. The guy who walks through the hotel lobby, gets on the elevator with a crowd of people. Five minutes after they get off the elevator, you can't remember that they were there. Just like looking through a piece of clear window glass. They're just not there. If you're the person that stands in line at the market, the clerk keeps waiting on the person behind you, you know you're gonna be a good spy. A good friend and I decided that we were going to infiltrate the dance. We had the greasers and we had the socias in our particular school. And we were, we were on the side of the greasers. We could infiltrate the dance if we showed up as a couple. So I was the girl. My mother helped by uh, getting a nice dress and some nice shoes and we purchased some hose and got a really good wig. It was really good. She plucked my eyebrows. I shaved a couple times, shaved my legs even, and uh, my sisters taught me to dance backwards. So here we were in the dance in the era of the crinoline skirts, had all these petticoats under it, and I was swirling about. I heard one of the guys, who's that big broad that Doug's with? <laughs> it was our first deception, and it worked rather well. The beginning of a career for the master of disguise. Yes. This is my first mission to do disguise. Vientiane in those days was the diplomatic capital of Laos. Everybody was interested in which way it was going to go. The KGB, PRC, every hard target, every communist intelligence service was in town trying to gain an advantage in the very small community. There was this swirl of activity, all these cars stopping and picking up their sources. And sometimes the source got in the wrong car and said, excuse me, you know, it was, the, it was the Soviet source and he got in the Chinese car, excuse me. It was the most disguised town in the world. There was a black CIA officer who had recruited a Lao cabinet minister. Every time they had a cabinet meeting, there had to be a clandestine meeting at night where this black officer would go out and make a car pickup. A black case officer in Laos. This is not a perfect world. The ambassador who was sent there by Richard Nixon, he requested that this black officer be transferred there. That doesn't mean it made sense. It just was the politics of the situation. So I sat down and wrote the problem up. Here's what I proposed to do. Maybe you could go to that fellow in Hollywood that you recently contacted. They took along my drawings and measurements and photographs, found the two molds, which were nothing more than Halloween masks, that came closest to these two individuals, Rex Harrison and Victor Mature. The black officer became Rex Harrison. He was tall. The Asian became Victor Mature. He was short, and they had to have, obviously, the right color hands to go along with it, so the guy sent along these zippered gloves. Their worst nightmare came true. There was a roadblock, and they would just wave through. They loved it, and of course, they did this over and over for a long time. Up to this period of time, the communists were pretty well contained, but now they're moving out into the third world, operate in Latin America, Parts of the Far East were in the past. We were the mayors of the town. We didn't have security problems. Nobody used disguise. Drawing from Hollywood, creating a research and development capability so that we were able to do things that were beyond Mission Impossible, to create the real Mission Impossible. Servicing an area from Indochina all the way to Afghanistan. We were into everything, everywhere. And I ended up, by 1974, being chief of disguise. You end up developing recipes of how to penetrate every border in the world. Suddenly, you need to get 
15 guys into an Iran to reconnoiter, these guys are saying, I ain't going unless I got the best. So you redefine what is the best. The best cover, the best legend, the best backstop. You figure out how to get the real thing, how to get the file in the issuing office. So if somebody is detained halfway around the world, if the phone call goes back, they say, yeah, that's a real guy. That's what you call backstop. Inventing stories for exactly. people. Exactly. Making them withstand intense scrutiny. There has been a dramatic development concerning other Americans in Iran, who probably would also be hostages today, except for... When the embassy was overrun, we were immediately on a wartime footing. Along comes a memorandum from the State Department saying, by the way, six of our people escaped, and they're in the care of the Canadians. Could you please think about how you might get them out too? So now we got a problem. How are we going to get them out ahead of hostile pursuit? The Iranians don't know they're there. But they will rather soon. My biggest problem creating a deception that everybody could believe in. A Hollywood location scouting party. We stole the script from The Lord of Life. It was a defunct production. Mythology, sci-fi, and mystical things. If you read the script, it is very hard to follow. It is very convoluted. My guys went in, set up the production offices on the old Columbia studio lot in Hollywood. This is a Friday. By Tuesday, four days later, we were up and running. You're posing as a Hollywood producer making a fictitious script, Lord of Light. Yes. The telephone that somebody's going to answer, oh, yeah, they're they're out there scouting a location. And then we made this portfolio that had everything in it that I would carry along with me, and that's the window dressing. Say, okay, that's you, and that you're the location manager, your transportation coordinator, and the set designer, and, 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 and they all just loved it. You know, everybody wants to be from Hollywood. And we arrived on the 25th of January. We went in and marched them out three days later. Mental skills how to make something out of nothing. My 25-year career at the CIA was that. Somebody that could make a radio out of a clamshell. That's the kind of individual that it takes. The kind of person who can appear humble. The kind of person who doesn't need to be recognized. The kind of a hero that never needs to be identified as a hero. It's just a particular type of person. Some of them, I guess, are heroes. What happens at the end of Lord of Light? I have no idea. I didn't have time to read it. This voice on the telephone said, the KGB has your name and your specialty. Somebody was being interrogated in Vietnam, ice water running down my back. They know who I am. The day that you were expecting to happen sometime in your career is upon you. Then the call comes for somebody to go survey Moscow using disguise, something they hadn't done before. This is a big thing. This is the big playing field. Wimbledon Center Court, the belly of the beast. When we landed, it was out of a dream. Day looked like night. It was February, and as the plane taxied up to the terminal, you could see soldiers standing in the gloom with their big fur hats and their long great coats and their rifles. Foreboding, all those things that you'd seen in movies, now you're seeing them in real life. It was a time in history when we were moving into the Moscow arena in a real big way. 
we are starting to acquire more sources and anytime you have a human being in that kind of situation you have to be able to press the flesh you can't always use dead drops or one-way voice links you've got to look them in the eye you got to say how you doing and they got to see you they got to feel confident that they're not being deceived so the dream at this particular point in history is that we could have these moments with the source you had just lost a source, correct? No. Well, Petkovsky. Oh, Petkovsky, yeah, that was earlier on. That was a decade before that. In about 1960, Petkovsky was caught and he was executed in about 1963, fed into a furnace feet first. When I arrived, there was a another Penkovsky. We suspect that he's there already, but we're not sure whether he's going to have the guts to resurface. Because a lot of times when they get back, they say, I don't think so. <laughs> this is far too dangerous. We were able to bring him on using cloak and to run him for some time. We supplied him with a concealed L-pill, a cyanide capsule in the barrel of his favorite fountain pen. Fifteen months later, he was caught. He died instantly. nothing. Murphy is right. Never go against your gut. Everyone is potentially under opposition control. Don't look back. You are never completely alone. Go with the flow. Use the terrain. Establish a distinctive and dynamic profile and pattern. Stay consistent over time. Let them believe they lost you. Act innocent. Lull them into a sense of complacency. There is no limit to a human being's ability to rationalize the truth. Once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is an enemy action. Use misdirection, illusion, and deception. The commandments of espionage. Exactly. They are saying, spend a great amount of your time on the streets observing the people because you're the expert. You look at things differently. That's why you're here. You're forced to pose as a low-level bureaucrat. I choose to pose. It's the obvious thing to do. How'd you dress? What'd you look like? What'd you do? Things that are deadly boring. You continue to gray yourself down. The really good spies don't need disguises. They're just uninteresting. The little gray man. Yeah. The invisible man. Yeah. One thing I notice, whenever I ask you a story, you always say you instead of I. It's always in something other than the first person. How come? I don't know. What were you doing in Moscow? What was I doing? I was there looking at the stage where the audience was sitting, what the audience was thinking. And then I had to look at the players, how they felt, what they thought, where they wore their fountain pen, what kind of belt buckle they found interesting. So I was getting into the fine grain of the fabric of that environment. People in the motion picture industry who helped us said, geez, the only difference between what you do and we do is we make monsters and you fool the villains. It's the same bit. You're creating an illusion, you're creating a reality. You just happen to have a very interesting script. It takes a silver bullet to kill the werewolf, the vast surrounding army of KGB surveillance. You know there's 30 of them out there and most of them are 
out of sight all the time. How do you know there are 30 of them out there? Well, there are at least 30 of them out there. There could be 300, there could be 3,000. There are several million people watching several million people. You can see yourself moving through the maze, floating above the city, above the geography. You know that if you do a stair-step pattern across a grid of streets for 20 minutes, anybody who's trying to parallel you is either going down one-way streets the wrong way or they're running at a pace that no human can maintain. And that's where you, you go black. You know you're alone. It's a very powerful feeling of invisibility standing there in broad daylight in the middle of the intersection watching them swirl around and you know they can't see you. And I wanted to be the best operative alive to rob the bank every week, the same bank, and nobody knows the money's gone, to be the ultimate thief. We all get our value system in our first 10 years of life, I guess. Did it come from your mom? I, I can remember as a teenager this conscious awareness of my mother being present at all times. My weather vane, my moral compass. Mother is watching? Yeah, big brother, mother, whoever. When your mom tells you Never tell a lie. What do you tell her? I can't remember that she said that. She might correct me in some way, but I think it was more for getting caught than for actually telling the lie. Convenient ways of rationalizing things, optimistic interpretations of the truth. Our lot in life on occasion was bleak. I wouldn't say we were homeless because we had a tent. She would come up with an optimistic outlook about it, you know. What if the whole world was in a disaster state? You'd be the one who'd know how to survive. You'd know how to go out and survive in the wilderness. You have to reckon with the idea, well, what if I get shot down? What if I get captured? What if they nail me into a box? What am I gonna do if? If I was nailed into a box and I somehow had a little bit of light leaking in, or even if I didn't, I would find something to start mocking the inside the box and end up with the Sistine Chapel by the time I was released, you know, 12 years later. Every time you got a new alias, you had to fill out a form wherever you put your will, uh, you know, what about your insurance? What if you're missing without a trace? And I used to always answer that question, try to find me. What other answer could there be? And torture? Yeah, what if you get tortured? <laughs> what are you gonna say? <laughs> you know, you had to think about that. What would you say? I would make something up the best I could for as long as I could. I would have fun. Unwrap the onion a layer at a time. Take them somewhere in your imagination, but you always lead them away from the truth. Never the truth. Never the truth. I expected to go to my grave with that kind of layering. I had to take myself back to those times, read books about what was happening in the world, read other books written by intelligence officers, remember. You just couldn't remember on your own? Too many things tucked away in places. You consciously would forget them, the truth. The Wilderness of Mirrors, spy, versus counter-spy, versus double agent, triple agent. Losing your way uh, as to who you should be lying to and who you should be telling the truth to. Knowing where you are, whether you're looking at the mirror image or the real. How do you get back to the world? 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can. The trick was to make sure that your moral compass was in good repair so that you didn't lose track uh, of which lies you were supposed to tell. You had to be rather sure of what your value system was, is. If you spend the entire time knowing that you're being watched, including in your own bed at night, this audience, all the time, you're not able to be you. Have the fight with your wife, reprimand the child, jump the light, because those are the things that normal people do. So you have to become adept at playing yourself as if you are an actor in your own life who has taken on the role of you. No, you have to be an actor in your life taking on the role of the real you. You want to stay loose, relaxed, and act natural. Do you ever think to yourself, this is what I would do if I were me? You have to remind yourself that this is what you ought to do if you were me, yeah. It was May and it was warm. Wool coat, a heavy dress, long dark stockings. Went down this alleyway and sat down on the sidewalk uh, to rest in the shade and along came somebody's maid and said, mm, and I got up and beat it out of there. But probably the most challenging disguise. How many different people have you been in one day? half a dozen maybe that was an intense day that wasn't a typical day this is why you can't read my signature these days because it doesn't really say anything what's my name again the hand of a thousand faces inventing stories for exactly people. when you go to Montevideo and walk down the street and find the address that the guy has given in Timbuktu, somebody opens the door and you look through the door and you see his picture sitting on the mantel. Think about that. And if you got 15,000 cases like that, how do you do that? Wait a minute. What if the whole world is just an illusion that you've invented? Just, just confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Saw a billboard recently. Single sentence. Don't make me come down there. Sign God. Don't make me come back there. <laughs> Next on four, question of attitude and commitment in Balia changed my life.